We're going to be continuing with, with the theme of uh, Priscotheologia. Okay? Priscotheologia is uh, the ancient uh, theology. Now, uh, astrotheology is a big part of this. Um, it's probably a third of it. <laughs> Uh, and astrology, which I was dealing with last week, is a big chunk of it too. So, um, continuing with this theme of uh, ancient theology, we're going to honour a truth speaker of the 16th century, because he died in the, on the 17th of February, 1600, Giordano Bruno. Now, Giordano Bruno was a person who spoke about the Prisca Theologia all the time and he was bringing it to the world. In fact, he brought it to Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth was contemplating bringing, uh, making the, the British Isles hermetic. But of course, the, uh, the clergy um, got wind of the, the plot, sent Giordano Bruno a packing back to Italy, and uh, of course made sure that fictional uh, <coughs> Roman Christian religion would continue in their country. What I mean by that is that, um, and as I've proven with my uh, presentations, that Rome has invented the fiction of the historical uh, Jesus Christ <coughs> for purposes of enslavement. Um, astrotheology, now when you mention astrotheology, uh, people, people think, I actually um, <clears throat> have seen comments on the internet where people think it's just a recent term and it's just recently been invented by, say, Jordan Maxwell or someone like Michael Tassarian or one of those guys. But um, here's um, Kirstie Graves from 1880. 1880. And um, <clears throat> he uses the word astrotheology. This guy also, the Reverend Robert Taylor, uses the expression. And he's from 1830s, okay? Now, first thing that happens is when you talk about astrotheology is that the churchgoers uh, poo-poo the idea. And they deny that Christianity has anything to do with the stars. Uh, the original religio-slash-science religio of this planet. You see, uh, the Prisca Theologia um, explains that the stars were originally uh, the, uh, the components of nature that were uh, studied and observed with intent to discover our origins and uh, many truths about reality. And what they did was they uh, encoded uh, books uh, writings in which they would um, reveal their discoveries to mankind. So they discovered a lot by observing the stars, you see, the ancient priesthoods. And uh, in doing so, they realised that we were more than connected with the stars. You know, we were very, very connected with the stars. So what developed was a, um, a science whereby if we take note, notice of nature, and the most um, potent aspects of nature would have to be the stars, the lights in the skies. They called them the uh, spirit father fountains of life. And they realised that these um, entities had uh, an influence on us. They observed these influences and uh, recorded them. And um, the Bible, the Judeo-Christian uh, work, Hebrew, Christi uh, Greek writings, uh, nothing other than astrotheological themes. Okay, they are stories about the uh, observances of the stars and their behaviour and their cycles, etc. So the first thing they do, the religionists, is um, they deny that. Um, the origin of their, uh, their faith and belief is based on uh, the stars, you see. So what we're going to do is have a look at some of the words and um, designations of the ministers and um, 
the people who uh, practice in the churches. Um, so we've got Cardinal, Deacon, Sexton, Monseigneur, Sir, Nun, Minister, Pastor, Monk, Ceremony, Bishop, Orison, Monastery, etc. Uh, cardinal, this is um, in astrology, this is the four cardinal signs. Okay, Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn. A deacon is 10 degrees of astrology. Sexton, having the word six in it um, and having to do with uh, astrology, just like bishop is, three degrees. Ten degrees, three degrees. Uh, Monseigneur, Sir. Sir is just short for the star Sirius because he's the Lord. He's the boss. He's the brightest star in the sky. Yes, Sir. Uh, none. Uh, minister. Here we see moon and star. Same with pastor. Moon. Ceres. Moon. Bishop. Already discussed that. Orison. Moon. Star. Monastery. Um, <clears throat> now that's pretty much the uh, designations that these uh, ministers give themselves. Uh, another good one would be uh, elder in the L words. When you look at the L words, you'll notice uh, a lot of um, L in there because of the sun, Elios. You see, in Greek, the sun is called Elios. And in the Jewish system, the Elohim happened to be the planets and the uh, luminaries in the sky, the seven visible orbs. And you see the words such as elect, elite, the elder in the congregation. He's, he is a, he'd be a uh, minister, would he not? A moon star, one who talks about El, Israel, Isis, Ra and Elohim, evangelizing, etc., etc. I mean, these are all church words, okay? Um, and so because the, the sun is is the El who provides three things to mankind for their existence. Uh, and that would be love, light and life, undeniably. For that orb has more love for us than any other. It, it's the creator of everything physical in the solar system. And uh, together with the other six are what cause us to manifest in the physical realms. Uh, so we get love, that's very loving. We get light, we get three qualities of light, spiritual, psychic and physical light from the sun, which gives life. Um, and so you see all the L words with the five vowels, anything El, Al, Il, Ul, Ol. Here we have Olympians. Here we have um, Bull. Here we have Il, that's the definite article in Italian. L is the definite article, um, the um, male gender definite article in Spanish, male uh, definite gen um, article in Italian. Okay? And we get words like uh, bello in Italian. Um, if, if someone is handsome, you say, oh, bello. Or some, uh, someone's uh, pretty, a girl's pretty, you say bella. And that comes from the L, okay, because nothing is more pretty than the sun. Especially in the summertime, when he revitalizes the planet. And so, of course, and the Bible is uh, related to Babel. Babel and Bible are the same word. Babel means circle of the sun, the zodiac. Okay? Um, and, of course, and it's related to bubble, circle. Bubble, Babel, Bible. Um, Bel is Baal, the god Baal. And he also, if you put a, a, an O on the end of that, you get the Italian word for good looking. Bello. Because Baal is the sun. He's glorious. He's Prince Charming. Okay, so these Il, El, Al, Ol, they are all the sun. The El Lord. So 
So when you hear expressions like the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen, these are all different words for the Son. Okay? Lord, <clears throat> yes, yes means the Son. There we have the, the, the golden orb himself, beautiful, Prince Charming. Bello. And there are the words, the letters. I E S. In Greek, I E S is yes. And that's uh, Jesus. Christ, well, Christ is light, king, the king of light, and that's the sun. And Amen or Amun or Om, um, that is the sun. So we've come to a time in, in history that we've, um, we've begun to understand these things because we've been able to uh, decipher the, uh, the Egyptian uh, holy writings, the, the um, hieroglyphs. And in recent times we've um, been able to uh, expose this story that is in the Bible. Now, we have many uh, great scholars to lean upon. Uh, probably I would say this would be the best work, absolutely the best work in terms of astrotheology by the Reverend Robert Taylor. One of his con contemporaries was uh, Thomas Taylor, and Thomas Taylor was, um, was uh, a great scholar who um, was interpreting the Greek myths. I'm going to read a little bit out of this later on and also out of this. Contemporaries, this one's um, deciphering the holy Jewish Christian scriptures and this one, the myths. So we, we've got a lot of scholars of that nature. We have um, <clears throat> The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by uh, John Marco Allegro, one of the Dead Sea scholars who uh, discovered that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were nothing but um, writings about the Essenes who had Gospels and were already talking about a suffering servant or a Messiah hundreds of years before the so-called historical Christ. Um, he's come out and uh, explained that, um, that uh, the Bible is based on mythologies and um, the Amanita muscaria mushroom being the, uh, the base for Christianity. Um, <coughs> they used to take the Amanita muscaria mushroom as the uh, Eucharist, you see, the, the bread of Christ, and they would have out-of-body experiences. And um, so one of the Dead Sea Scroll scholars has shared that with the world. Of course, they went after him and, um, and uh, defamed him and, and destroyed his career. Uh, but nonetheless, he was a truth speaker. Here's another truth speaker, Dupuy, a um, contemporary of um, Napoleon Bonaparte, as well as Volney, these guys exposed the astrotheology in the Bible. I'm going to share excerpts and, 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 and um, share um, interesting um, information from these scholars today. So it's going to be very eclectic, but there's a lot of uh, interesting information that we're going to expose. Here is the, uh, the Earth and that would be the equator, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. Now I'm following a, um, a very ancient map, and by the way, a lot of people ask me about where do I get my uh, maps and stuff from. Well, that's the book, you can get that on uh, Amazon, Star Maps. And uh, in fact, it has uh, lots of great ancient maths, maps and uh, a great collection, probably one of the best I've ever seen. It's phenomenal. And so this comes from that book. Uh, here is the sine wave that I've just done. As you can see, there's the equator. And here we have the Tropic of Cancer. And here we have the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay. So um, this sine wave, this is the path that the sun appears to make uh, around the uh, earth as it goes through the seasons. It's called the ecliptic. Okay, so it's the path that the, um, that the sun takes through the 12 signs of the zodiac. So um, there's a little glyph here 
for Aries, which indicates that the sign of Aries begins here, and that would be the 21st of March, the uh, equator, the equinox. And uh, as it rises, as the sun rises in the, the spring skies through uh, March, April and June, it reaches the um, Tropic of Cancer and then it uh, proceeds to decline and wane and goes through Libra and there's the scales of Libra. That's the middle point of the sine wave. Okay? Very important, crucial part of the theologies and a lot of the stuff in the Bible pertains to this area here because the scales of Libra that sit on that equinox there have to do with justice and the fall of the sun as the sun falls down to the winter months below the equator. The scales have judged the sun. So that point there is very interesting and these are the cardinal points. Aries, the equinox, Cancer, the uh, solstice, uh, Libra, the equinox, and Capricorn, the solstice. And it comes back through, through Aquarius, the water bearer, through Pisces, and then back up into Aries. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm following that. So we start here at uh, Aries, and we go up to Cancer, and then down to Capricorn, and then come back up again. And uh, that's the sine wave. It's 23 and a half degrees and 23 and a half degrees. Now, so what you've got here is the solstice. And here we have also the solstice. So these, this would be the uh, summer months and this would be the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, March the 21st is over here. June 21st is there at the solstice. September 21st at the equinox. And December 21st, the solstice. These are the crucial points. There's a lot to be said about these points and you will, you will see how uh, important they are in the scriptures. Okay? What I'm going to show today is that um, the Gospels of Matthew and uh, Luke start from... Start from December the 21st and finish with December the 21st, whereas Mark and John started Aries. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to show that and um, with the aid of this book here. The Secret Truth About Jesus, the Gospel and the Zodiac by the Reverend Bill Darlison. And in here he shows how the 16 chapters of the Gospel of Mark uh, run through, starting from Aries, run through and finish in Pisces. Okay? And of course I've uh, dealt on that in my uh, astro-theological presentations and um, shown how most of the cycles begin with this point in the, um, in the year. The equinoxes are so important that on this particular day and its opposite, September the 21st, these two equinoxes, the sun splits the day between 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of light, perfectly balanced. That balance is measured by the priesthoods and they consider it to, to be a sacred day that point of equilibrium. Equilibrium is always respected in nature. It's always respected. So you see these two spheres, the two polarities of light, summer, and darkness, winter, are balanced at these points. Very, very powerful points in the year, the equinoxes. In fact, they are so respected that all our religious, religious observances are, uh, take place at these four points, at the four points of the cross. Here we have the, the Passover of the Jews and Easter. Here we have uh, Judgment Day, Rosh Hashanah, um, the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. And here we have the Holy Saturnalia and the Christmas period. 
where the, the, um, the ancients would mourn for Saturn. That was the Saturnalia, and, uh, or Saturn's brother, the sun. They would mourn for the sun because he was going down to his death on the 21st of December. And so um, Macrobius, in his famous work, the Saturnalia, talks about this festival and its origins. And uh, in doing so, he revealed a lot about um, the old astrotheological system. In fact, he revealed that every one of the names of the heroes, including Jesus, mean the sun. And here are some of the, um, here are some of the names of those uh, ancient gods. Janus, Bacchus, Yeus, Apollo, Julio, Delios, Loxias, Phobus, Phanes, Lucius, Sabasius, Liber, Ebulis, Dionysus, Yao, Hades, Mars, Meton, Mercury, Draco, Asclepius, Hercules, Serapis, Adonis, Attis, Osiris, Horus, Pan, Jupiter, Saturn, Adad. Interesting. So we'll get back to that. But um, what we have here now is the... Um, the uh, cycle that causes the Gospels to be told. So, <clears throat> what we have is, according to um, Reverend Bill Dalson, as we begin in Aries, I'm going to share some scriptures with you, which um, prove the, uh, the astrological uh, aspects of the Gospels. Uh, so beginning with um, Aries, the deacons of Aries, uh, it talks about Perseus and Cetus and um, Andromeda. So if we go to Aries at the head, remember Aries is always the start of this system because it's in the head. Uh, we see there's Perseus, Cassopia um, and Andromeda is always associated with Pisces, but the stars overlap um, with this zodiac sign here. Uh, here we have Taurus, Orion, Eridanus, and Auriga. Okay, so, and these are the deacons. You have the northern deacons here. Um, so, for instance, Scorpio has three northern deacons. It doesn't have any southern deacons. Whereas Libra has a northern deacon, and it has some southern deacons, okay? And these are, there's 15 in the southern and 21 in the northern. And they make, up, they make up 36 extra zodiacal signs, okay? Now, one of the first things that uh, is spoken about in Aries um, is the apostle, uh, or rather, John the Baptist calls um, Jesus... Um, the, um, talks about the baptism of fire. Well, that would be the fire of Aries. Okay, so that's the first hint. As the, as the sun comes into Aries, there's the fire aspect. And um, <clears throat> we'll just have a look at that um, part in the Gospel of uh, Mark. It says, I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with Holy Spirit. And, of course, Matthew and Luke use the word fire in that, right? But the spirit has to do with the baptising uh, in Aries because what happens in Aries is there is the river Eridanus goes through there from the sign of Taurus next door. And the Eridanus is the Jordanus where uh, Jesus is baptised. So that's where John baptises Jesus immediately and the gospel begins there. And I'm talking, that's the first, there's St. Mark, that's the first passage in the Bible where Jesus is baptised. There's no nativity in uh, either Mark or John. There's no nativity scene. Whereas Matthew and Luke, they begin with the nativity when the son is a baby on the 25th of December. It has to grow and then be baptised in the Jordan River in the head of Aries. 
Um, <clears throat> And um, here's another interesting scripture right there after that passage. It says, Immediately afterwards, the Spirit drove him out of the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels looked after him. Well, the wild beast would be the beasts of the zodiac. You see, it says that Jesus was with the wild beasts. That's where the sun is. Lions, scorpions, etc. Okay, so they are Aryan features. Um, then in uh, chapter verse 17, Andrew cast a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, uh, some translations use the word uh, hired men. Well, that has to do with the stars in the sign of Aries, in the deacon of Aries, Aries that, are called, uh, that are called the hired men. Let me read a portion of this. The combat between Perseus and Cetus mirrors the challenge to the powers of evil which Jesus makes in these early chapters of Mark. He is tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He casts out an unclean spirit. He declares that the kingdom of Satan is at an end. Uh, clearly, and he implies that Satan has been bound, clearly reflecting the names of two stars in Cetus, Menkar, the chained enemy, and Difda, the overthrown, the thrust down. Isn't that interesting? Then there's a star in uh, Perseus called Algol, and this is called by the Hebrews Algol as Rosh Ha Satan. And it's supposed to be, it says here that um, it's the demon star and the blinking demon, the demon's head, is said to have been thus called from its rapid and wonderful variations. The Hebrews call Algol as Rosh HaSatan, Satan's head. Head. Aries, the head. Uh, astrologers, of course, said that it was the most unfortunate, violent and dangerous star in the heavens. So the name of Satan appears a lot in the early chapters of Mark in the Aries sector, okay? And of course because of the stars, Algol in Perseus, the, the, the star that they call the most violent one in the skies. And so that explains all the, uh, the um, mentions of Satan in the first chapters of Mark, okay? Um, another incident happens in Mark 1.29, and this is the incident. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So. Simon Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. Well, Simon's other name is Cephas. And you'll notice that Cephas, uh, Cephas in, in um, Pisces is also merging in with Aries. You see, that, that's how it works. So Cephas is in here. And Cephas is another name for the Apostle Peter. Right? Uh, and Andrew would be Andromeda. Right? Andrew. <laughs> so these are in the first chapters of Mark, right? Dealing with uh, the March Aries sector. So the mythological Cassopia was the wife of Cephas and the mother of Andromeda, whom Perseus had married after releasing her from the rock to which he had been chained by the sea god Poseidon. Cassopia was eventually translated to the sky by her enemies, the sea nymphs, but because of her vanity and arrogance, was placed so close to the pole that she appears to be lying prone. Well, the mother, the mother of the one chained to the rock, see, Cassopia was chained to the rock. Well, the rock is Cephas, Peter. Peter's called the rock. <laughs> is Cassopia. So the one chained or married 
to the rock, Peter, is Cassopia, the reclining woman. Cassopia's husband is Cephas, another name for Peter, the rock. Uh, and her daughter is Andromeda, uh, which names which are hinted at in the names Andrew and Cephas. Now, another thing that um, Bill Darlison points out in this book is that uh, unlike the Gospel um, Mark, the Gospel John, which also begins in Aries, in the first chapter of John, uh, the Gospel of John, John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, pointing to the very same nature uh, of that Gospel to Mark's Gospel. Unfortunately, Mark doesn't use that expression, but all the, other, all the others do. <laughs> and if it had of, that would really just put the icing on the cake, wouldn't it? All right, so that's um, Aries. Let's have a look at Taurus and see if we can see some uh, themes there in the uh, early chapters. By the way, I'll just put that up for the camera <clears throat> to pick up. Um, this comes straight out of the book. And uh, it shows the, um, <clears throat> the different sectors uh, of the Gospels. So Aries is from the first chapter to the third chapter. Okay? And it's dealing with the baptism of Jesus, the beginning of ministry, theme of newness, 12 apostles as new Israel, sense of urgency, daring and defiance. In the Zodiac, the key words would be uh, sign of the spring equinox, initiation, action, impulsiveness, assertiveness, pioneering, associated with the head. And you will find all of these perfectly on cue in those chapters of Mark and dealing with the sign of Aries. Okay? Uh, Taurus, parables of growth, agricultural Im imagery, parable of light. Now, because of the special stars in Taurus, Taurus has um, a cluster of stars called the Pleiades, which are the lights. Okay? So, we notice now in the, um, in the fourth chapter of Mark, which I'm going to be reading from, the, the theme is dealing with um, uh, light and also the parables of the seeds. Because in Taurus, Taurus is the time of the year when you take your bull out and plough. So you notice that in the fourth chapter of Mark, there's a lot of ploughing being done, a lot of seed sowing, and a lot of talk about lights, because Taurus has those beautiful Pleiades, and the Hyades, and Orion, and all those bright stars. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> the parable of the light under the bushel, which follows the sower, does not have the Taurian imagery of growth and productivity except in rather an oblique sense. But it is related to Taurus nevertheless, because in addition to its association with the earth and with agriculture, Taurus has always considered by the ancients to be connected with light. Um, for instance, Venus rules Taurus, and Venus is phosphorus. She is the bright morning star, and she's one of the brightest orbs. In fact, she's the third brightest orb in the sky. That's one pointer to the fact that it's dealing with Taurus. Uh, another one is um, the principal star of the Hyades group, situated in the eye of the bull, was called by Ptolemy, Lampadias, that would be lamp, Lampadias, the torch. So you see, Jesus will be talking about light. Don't hide your light, show your light. <clears throat> Venus, the ruler of Taurus and the most brilliant sight in the evening and morning sky after the moon was called by the Greeks Phos. Phos meaning light, and by the Romans, Lucifer, the light bearer. So no wonder chapter 4 deals with light. To the ancient occultists, Venus was the planet of inner light, illumination. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> Aristophanes called it Plias Eptesteros, the seven-starred Pleiades. So we're talking about the Pleiades now. Although he said that one of them is Panaphanes, all invisible. One of the stars of the Pleiades is hidden according to the myth. The Pleiades were the seven daughters of Atlas, who had been changed into stars by Pleione. Six of them had been married to gods, but the seventh, Merope, had married a mortal. So her light was dim and rarely seen, all of which strikingly reflects the parable of the lamp in Mark 7, 21, 22. Now take note, this is very interesting because we're talking about the seven sisters here, the Pleiades. Okay, now, you ever notice that? Subaru, that means the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Now, when you look up at the Pleiades, they, they're magnificent. They look exquisite, like a jewel in the sky, and they correspond to the pineal gland, okay? Because here they are in Taurus, Pleiades. They're supposed, to, they're supposed to be more up toward here, actually, these around this area here, uh, because Taurus rules the, the lower part of the head. Um, but you will only notice six. There are not seven because uh, one of them has had their lights dimmed. So let's notice what uh, Mark chapter 4, 21 has to say, shall we? He said to them, Do you bring a lamp? Do you bring a, in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? In, instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whoever is hidden, for whatever is hidden, is meant to be disclosed. And he uses the word here, Phanerothe in Greek. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Phaneron. If, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, as I just read before about Erastathenes, he called one of those uh, stars the exact same word that Mark uses for the dimming of the light, which is Phanophanes. So Erastophanes called this, this star Phanophanes, the all invisible. Interesting that Mark should use the exact same word for the, the dim star in the Pleiades. Uh, still on the, the, the Taurus uh, sign, we need to um, focus our attention on that. Um, <clears throat> of course, agricultural Im imagery and the parable of light. Oh, thanks, George. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> That'll help that. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, <clears throat> this is also in Mark. Okay. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of the seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such branches that the birds can perch in the shade. So notice the theme there of agricultural imagery, uh, parables of growth, and this is, these are the themes of the, um, of the fourth chapter of Mark. Right on cue with... Aries the first, Taurus the second. And it gets better. Mark 4, 10 to 12. When he was done, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. 
otherwise they might, might turn and be forgiven. How about Gemini? All right, so we come to Gemini. <clears throat> We've done Aries, Taurus, and now Gemini, the twins. What themes of Gemini do we have in the Bible in the uh, fourth to sixth chapter of Mark? Themes of duality, man with a legion, the Tunis <laughs> of Geminis, Geminians, um, the flow of blood and the cure of Jairus's daughter, the apostles sent out in twos, uh, Herod's uh, vacillation. So, and here they are, short journeys, has to do with the third house of, of astrology. Uh, siblings and relationships, of course. Well, that's the Geminis, and we're going to see this in the Gospel. Indecision and communication. Now, I'm, I'm really just picking the, the choice bits here because I've, I've got the whole thing to go through. Uh, so it's probably going to take about a half an hour, but, and I want to discuss many, many other themes. I don't want to just... Uh, discuss the Gospel of Mark, showing that Mark starts in Aries with the baptism and Pisces with the, the death. Okay, the sign of the cross. So uh, Gemini, there are a few details in the story which underline its Geminian theme. The word for the storm used by Mark is Laelops, but Laelops is also the name of the hound of Acteon in Greek mythology a name associated with the constellation Canis Major, one of the deacons of Gemini. Right? So Jesus tells the storm to cease with the word Siopa, be quiet, echoing the Spartan name for Gemini, Tosio, and the cushion upon which Jesus' head was resting along, believed to be a detail provided by Peter, echoes the headgear of the Geminian twins, or the flames of fire which were supposed to issue from their heads. So that's basically, basically the themes of those chapters dealing with um, these uh, extra zodiacal signs. There's um, Gemini there, Canis Major, um, Canis Menor and Lepus, the hare, which, which is what the, the fourth chapter of uh, Mark deals with. Okay, um, there's also the incident of the Legion who, um, who says, my name is Legion and for we are many. That has to do with the, uh, the duality aspect of Geminians, okay? Let's see if there are some other points in Gemini, some good points that I want to... Okay, well, let's go to uh, this miracle of the... Uh, Jarius and the woman with the blood flow. So after he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk and she was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this and told them to give us something to eat. Well, uh, this incident happened immediately after Jesus was touched by a woman who had a, a flow of blood which was for 12 years. So Jairus' daughter was 12 years old and the other incident immediately before that had to do with 12 years, indicating uh, a twin parable. Okay. The most obviously Geminian feature of Jiro the story of Jairus' daughter is the way in which it is told. It is the only miracle story in the Gospels which combines two quite separate elements. Uh, elements. Nehemiah writes, What we have here is without precise parallel in the Gospel, an incident broken into by another incident which takes place in the middle of it. Right. In addition, however, we should consider the name Jarius, Yarius, which means appropriately Jehovah enlightens, but which also bears more than a passing resemblance to the name of the brightest star in the night sky, 
Sirius. Serios. The dog star, which is found in Canis Major, right? That's where Sirius is, in the dog star. Um, one of the Geminian deacons, and whose name means the chief one, the leader, Jarius, we are told, uh, the leader or ruler of the synagogue. And as Ptolemy reminds us, the heliacal rising of Sirius at the summer solstice presaged the beginning of the Egyptian New Year and the flooding of the Nile. Thus, concerning, uh, thus connecting this star with the constant menstruating, constantly menstruating woman. In addition to being a possible zodiacal reference, Mark's double use of the number 12 provides us with further evidence that we are meant to link the two females and that this double story is not just a narrative accident. The woman with the flow, the blood flow, has been sick for 12 years. The little girl is 12 years old. The, constant, the contrast between the girl and the older woman reflects two of the deacons of Gemini, Canis Major and Canis Menor. Okay, and there's also the mention of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Twin Cities, in Mark 6.11. Okay? Now, I have to apologise because this is sort of a little bit sort of dull and boring because it's real nitty-gritty names of stars and everything like this. And this guy has done a lot of homework and it's a beautiful, exquisite book the way he's put it together. And he's mixed astrology with astronomy, with astrotheology and beautiful metaphysical themes. It's just such a rich book. I wish I could just spend the whole, you know, four hours on this, but I just have to fly through it. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to really fly through because we've only done three, three of those uh, signs, okay? Um, but there's some real, oh look, there's some real obvious ones. Cancer is um, <clears throat> themes of uh, nurture, the motherliness of the cancer sign with the moon in it, um, food and stomach concerns, uh, etc. Well, that's all in there. Um, the boat is in Cancer, the boat Argo. So Argo is the ship that is up here, you see, and that is, according to the Venerable Bede, um, that is the Ark of Noah. And interesting that um, two deacons of Gemini are Canis Major and Canis Minor. The two deacons of uh, Cancer are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And Noah, in his boat, on top of Mount Ararat, brought in animals two of two. The only place where two ofs occur in the whole zodiac is right where, right here where Argo is in the constellation of Cancer. So you have Cancer here. Argo, the ship. Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. In Gemini, you have Canis Major and Canis Menor. And, so, and, there's, and, there's, um, and there's the ship right there, bringing in the twos and the twos. Okay? Now, I, I didn't make that up. You want to read the, uh, the Venerable Beads. Uh, and he was uh, from the 6th century, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so... Um, and it also... There is the incident in the cancer sector where Jesus talks to the Syrophoenician woman about um, not giving uh, children's food to the dogs. Well, that would be because can it, the, um, the dogs are over here. Uh, in fact, Marcus Manilius, he mentions in this book, Marcus Manilius places one of the dogs, Procyon, in the sector of Cancer and not Gemini, as modern astrologers do. So there's the Cancer in the Gospel. Uh, Leo. Interesting. Leo. Let's have a good look at Leo, Virgo and Libra. Libra. In Leo, as I've discussed before in my astrotheology uh, presentations, there's Cancer, there's Leo and there's uh, Libra. Um, on the 6th of August, which happens uh, right about here, the middle of the hottest part of the year, on the 6th of August, the Catholic Church calls that day the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The 6th of August. It's the middle of Leo. It's the middle of summer. 
it would be, and the dog uh, Sirius is behind the sun, so you've got the, the dog days. There's a famous painting by Raphael. This is very famous. And there's Jesus Christ at the Transfiguration. And there's um, the, his apostles there, and they saw, um, I think it's um, Moses and, and Elijah. Okay? So let's have a listen, let's have a look at and see how, how um, Mark ties that in with the, uh, the sign of Leo. So on a journey to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? The text goes on. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Well, Jesus takes them to an unusually high mountain. And that's the unusually high mountain. And uh, it says, Six days, six days after, in fact, I'll read that from the Bible. This is too, uh, too good to be lost. Uh, here's uh, Mark uh, chapter 9. So you see, it's, he's going to be dealing with the transfiguration and the glory. So all these themes are dealt with in, uh, in Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9 in the Leo sector of the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Mark 9 verse 2. Six days later, right, remember the 6th of August is the Transfiguration Day. And they've, they're giving you a hint. Six days later, uh, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where he could be alone, where they could be alone by themselves. There, in their presence, he was transfigured. His clothes became dazzlingly, dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleacher could make them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. There you have it. Elijah and Moses, Peter, Andrew and James on the mountain. Six days after he was transfigured. Well, that's the 6th of August. I mean, it's pretty, it's, it's really blatant. When you know what you're looking for and you're reading the Gospels and you know the stars that are there and what they do, and what they mean, you can't mistake this. There is no excuse for churchgoers to start going, oh yeah, but that's a, you're looking into it. It's not. It is there. And if you're not seeing it, it's because you're not looking. Simple as that. Now, let's see if I can chug along a little bit more. Um, interesting. We have another similar painting by Titian, around about the same time as the Raphael. That's the Virgin and the assumption of the virgin, virgin on the 15th of August, just a, a week after the Transfiguration. Wonder what's going on. Well, that would be the sun in Leo, because he rules in Leo and he's transfigured in Leo. Um, Virgo, uh, I made a big mistake before, didn't I? That's Virgo, not Libra. Libra is here. Yeah, I confused you, didn't I? <laughs> um, Virgo, on the 15th of August, disappears behind the sun. That's the assumption of the Virgin. Because on the 8th of September, over here, she gets reborn again, doesn't she? That's the nativity. Because she reappears. You see, when the sun is in a sign, the sign disappears. You can't see it because, well, for instance, we're in, um, today's the 13th of November. That's Scorpio territory. Now, it's, uh, what's the time? It's two o'clock. So the sun is above us. Behind the sun is the scorpion. You, you cannot see it in November. It's gone. And so that's why the Virgin Mary ascends and then she's born again. The nativity of the Virgin. Yeah, it's all, and it's all on cue. It's, it's um, all right, let's see what uh, Virgo has. Virgo has uh, teaching about humility, little children, warning against passivity and service. Because uh, the sixth house, uh, or, or Virgo, Virgoans are very service oriented. It's the sign of service. Okay, so in the gospel, Jesus is talking about service. Serve one another. 
etc. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and servant of all. So there's the theme of service. Uh, if anyone causes one of these little ones, who, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. So that's also Virgo and themes. All right, let's move on. Let's, I know I'm going to regret taking chunks out of this because there are so many good points, but I, you just can't. All I can do is show you some choice bits, and if the subject interests you, I would be getting this book. Um, it's just phenomenal. Okay, Libra. The entry of the sun into Libra marks the autumnal equinox in the northern hemisphere when day and night are equal once again. This is the midpoint of the year, the moment of equilibrium, when the forces symbolised by the day and the night are in perfect counterpoise. This has happened before, of course, when the sun entered Aries in the springtime. But there is a difference between these opposite but complementary point, points. At the spring equinox, the point of poise occurs before the daylight begins to dominate. In the autumn, this is reversed and the balance point presages the forthcoming massing of the darkness. The eternal interplay of light and darkness is symbolised by in the zodiac itself which on one level is nothing more than the yearly cycle projected on the sky. The first six signs then come under the dominion of daylight. The first six signs come under the dominion of daylight. <coughs> uh, and can be said to represent the light of individual consciousness struggling to establish its identity. This process is associated with the sun, the giver of light. It begins in Aries, the sign of the sun's exaltation, and reaches its climax in sun-ruled Leo. The signs which follow the autumnal equinox, however, are characterised by the gathering darkness and have to do with the group to which individuality has to be incorporated, if not submerged. These are social signs uh, which begin with Libra, the sign of the sun's fall or depression, and which reach their point of maximum power in Aquarius, the sign in modern astrological jargon of the sign's detriment. Uh, sorry, the sun's detriment. Interesting. <clears throat> in ancient Egypt, Libra was associated with Maat, the goddess of cosmic harmony and justice, whose special task was to weigh the hearts of the dead on the scales of justice, balanced against an ostrich feather, and she is usually depicted with a feather in her headdress. Those who failed her test were heavy-hearted, those who passed light-hearted. Among the Greeks, notably Hipparchus, Libra was eugos, the yoke. The very word used by Matthew in a passage immediately following Jesus' declaration that God has revealed the secrets of the kingdom to infants. Mark uses a word from the same root, sunzeogumi. I hope I got that right. Uh, when he writes, What God has joined, yoked together, let no man separate. separate. So Hipparchus called this sign the yoke, and Mark is talking about the yoke of marriage, right on cue with Libra. But there's a lot more. We're going to show, uh, see that in a minute. Among the Jews, the tribe of Issachar, described in Jacob's blessing as a strong ass crouched down between two burdens, is generally associated with Libra. The glyph, the glyph of Libra, what's that? That's the sun setting. Because this is a 24-hour clock too, of course. Remember, remember, on the 21st of March and, and September, the sun is balanced, right? It's perfectly balanced. So 
On that day, and only on that day, or those two days rather, does the sun rise at 6 a.m. and set at 6 p.m. Only on those two days. Okay? So, so 6 o'clock goes here, 12, 6 and 12. This is a daily cycle and it's a yearly cycle. And of course during the day there is more light than during the night. Just like there is more light in summer than there is in winter. So those two cycles are described by this, by this graph. Uh, but here, this is the middle point. This is the point where in the human body, um, Libra is the kidneys. So the sine wave is going through the body <coughs> in, the, um, in the scale of the balance. You see the sun setting there? Okay, when you, when you look at that. So that sun's signal that it sends yearly and daily fractally goes through our body in many, many fractals. It goes through the atoms, it goes through everything. It's the same fractal. This, it, this is the wheel, this is the cycle, this is what is going on all the time. Right? Uh, and the sun's telling you that. The sun, the sun tells us that in its path of the ecliptic. The ecliptic runs straight through our bodies. That's the ecliptic. So as above, so below. So when the sun is in Aries, it's in the head. When it's in Taurus, it's in this part. What does that mean? Well, it means it's, it's giving its polarity to that part of your physical body. So it'll, you'll, it'll, it'll manifest physically. Usually taurines have got nice strong necks. It shows in the neck. It actually shows. Um, but it also shows with their ruling planet Venus, you know. Um, it also shows in, you know, spiritual and psychological things too. Um, philosophers, many philosophers, as I showed last week in the presentation on astrology, uh, are Taureans. Most of the famous t uh, philosophers in history are Taurean because they want to speak. speak. You know, it, that's where the sun is. Geminians are, are, are in, the, in the lungs and in, and in the arms. You see the way they use their arms, etc., etc. So that's the path of the ecliptic. And it's defining everything. Wherever the sun makes that signal, fractally, which is everywhere, it defines the, the bodies that it, that it gives life to. All right? and, and, and the sun and the, and the six planets, the, the seven visible orbs, they are responsible for all of it. And you'll find that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is clearly showing us um, encrypted, beautiful encrypted wisdom about that cycle. It's clearly there. It is absolutely clearly there. Let's have a look at Libra, shall we? Now, I want to focus, this chart comes from the book, comes straight out of the book, and I want to focus on these three signs here, okay? Leo has three deacons, Virgo three deacons, Libra has three deacons, okay? Um, the first one is Hydra, the fleeing serpent. Crater is the cup, the holy grail that we drink from when we come down from cancer and we get intoxicated. The crater is always here. Uh, Corvus, and it's explained in the book that Corvus is also the crow, right? Uh, oh, sorry, the, crow, the, the, uh, the cock, the rooster, okay? Virgo has Coma, Centaurus, the horse, uh, Bootes, the shepherd, and Libra has Crooks, the cross, the southern cross, um, the wolf, the wolf of the night, and the crown. That would be the crown of thorns. So what's going on is this. Remember that, that point of equi equilibrium. There she is the just one, balancing the day perfectly. And there's the Southern Cross where the sun gets crucified. This is the big crucifixion, by the way. This is the one where the sun is plunged into the darker 
polarity. So that's big judgment. In fact, that day there is called Judgment Day by the Jews. Okay? And there's a lot of other reasons why it's judgment. I mean, the Egyptians, when you die, they call it westing because you're going down in the west where the sun sets. And the stars, when they go beyond the horizon, they die. They're born in the east. There they die. So this is the place of death. Libra is always there at 6 p.m. every day, judging stars and suns. Every planetary orb is judged by the scales. You see, this is the science that we've, we, were, we were given, the hermetic science of the Prisca Theologia. And uh, the priestcraft has made a, a mess of it, teaching literal rubbish stories about it. You know, like Humpty Dumpty is a real egg. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, sounds like a Monty Python skit, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there's the crown, uh, crown. it's also in uh, Libra, Corona. By the way, I'll just show you them here. Uh, let's do this. Leo in the heart, and the, the main star there is Corleones. And you remember the godfather, Corleone? Corleone is the heart of the lion, the core of the lion, Corleone. Uh, and, and that's the main star there in Leo, because Leo is in the heart. The sun lives in the heart, the middle kingdom. Okay? The three planets, the masculine ones are above, and the three feminine ones are below here, the, the three lower chakras. Okay? So when you're dealing with Leo, you've got Hydra, the serpent, the crater, the holy grail, the cup, and the crow. Um, Virgo has the, the horse. Pay attention because all of these nine deacons are spelled out in the Gospel of Mark around about the time of the sun passing through Libra. Okay? Uh, Coma Bernices with her hair. Booties, her husband Joseph, that's Mary, Virgin Mary and Joseph, the shepherd. He's the shepherd, but it's Joseph. And he has a red star, Arcturus. That's the, um, that's the bear. In the northern hemisphere, see these northern stars? The brightest star is Arcturus. All right? You see the California flag with the bear and the red star above it? That's the bear. Right? He rules the northern skies. There's the crown, Corona Borealis. That's the crown of thorns that the sun wears as it goes through Libra and gets crucified. That's the cross that he's crucified on. And the wolf, the other word for that sign is the victim. The victim is the sun. Gets judged at the scales, crown of thorn, there's the cross. Here is the shepherd. As you'll see, I'll, I'll, we'll go through that, etc. What happens there in Libra, the sun gets judged to go down to hell. There's the wolf there, the victim dies on a cross, gets a crown of thorns. Before that, in the Gospel, this is, these are the chapters. So you can see chapter 16, 14, 14, 11, 11, 14, 15, 15, 15. Um, so it, it's carrying those, the themes around about that part of the Gospel where it would be. Um, so the fleeing serpent is where Jesus defeats death. The cup is, he took the cup, in chapter 14, verse 23, there's the cup. The sun takes the cup because the sun gets intoxicated now. It's got a, Jesus is getting intoxicated. takes the cup. Um, and before the cock crows three times, that, that's mentioned in 1430. Uh, and there's the, the, the crow on cue. Coma, the infant, the branch, the desired one. And others cut down branches. Blessed is he. So as Jesus came in procession to be crucified. They cut down branches. Well, that's the branches of uh, Coma. Uh, Centaurus, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a cult. There's a cult here. The centaur is, belongs to Virgo. The, the centaur and the southern cross is right over here. Okay, So they are closely connected, those two constellations. There's also two cults over here, remember? I don't know whether you remember, but there's the Asinellus Borealis and Asinellus Australis in Gemini when Jesus comes into Jerusalem to be crucified. Well, this is what he's doing. There are four crucifixions. But this one's the big judgment one. 
Okay, there's the cult that he enters. He enters on a cult. The great shepherd, I will smite the shepherd. That's in Mark 14, 27. Um, and then the, the cross, as I've already shown in those graphs, the cross, the victim and the crown. These are all themes to do with the crucifixion. There's some, some choice stuff in this book. For instance, uh, in Capricorn, it talks about Saturday because Saturn rules Capricorn. And it says, the Jewish Sabbath is Saturday, Saturn's day. We noted earlier that Judaism was born when the equinoctial point entered the constellation Aries. And there is no doubt that Aryan imagery of rams, goats, sheep, sacrifices and circumcision play a major role in the liturgical practices of Judaism. But the other cardinal signs, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, feature prominently in the development of Judaism. Libra, the polar opposite of Aries, the sign of covenants and law. Cancer, the sign of home and diet and mother. Capricorn, the sign of duty, service, social responsibility and the father. See, mother, moon, Capricorn, father, Saturn. And, and when you do your houses, you'll find that the fourth house is, deals with mother, right? And the tenth house with honours and duty and service and, and authority and prestige and father because Saturn is the father. You see the polarities. We have to work out the polarities in all of this to understand the science. Once you start doing that, you can navigate through all of these books. You can read the Upanishads, you can read the Eddas, whatever, and you'll know what you're talking about, man. The characters are always the same. In the Bible, the characters are always the seven heroes, the seven that go manifesting, the Elohim, and they manifest in the space of 12. While Libra is the sign which symbolises the law's origin. And why? Well, because Libra is always to do with judgement and law. This is law, you know, when you get your heart weighed on that scale in Libra. While Libra is in the sign which symbolises the law's origin and purpose, Capricorn symbolises its operation and enforcement, legalism, concern for the letter of the law, is therefore Capricornian. Similarly, while Christianity is a Piscean religion, it also relates clearly to the other mutable signs. Now get this, right? Christianity is saying is, is a uh, Piscean religion, but it also relates to the other signs. Sagittarius, uh, Gemini, and um, Virgo. How? Well, uh, Virgo, Gemini, and Sagittarius. <coughs> it's its emphasis on virginity and celibacy are Virgoan. Its elaborate and divisive theology is Geminian, as are the letters which constitute a good portion of the Christian scriptures. And its missionary zeal and sacerdotalism are Sagittarian. Simple as that. All right, look, there's a lot of choice stuff in here and uh, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to... Uh, Leave it, because we're going on to some more stuff. Let's have a look at some science now, a little bit. Let's have a look at some S words, shall we? There's the S. We've got uh, <coughs> serpent, spiral, and sine wave, right? Now, the serpent is also a septenary. Those words are interchangeable in the mythologies. In fact, they have the same root word. And spiral also has to do with spirit. And sine wave has to do with sin. Okay? These are the six S words that we need to nut out and understand in order to, to get all this. Because you've got to bring in the metaphysics and you've got to bring in the, um, the, uh, the intention of the priesthood into this science. They didn't do this to, um, you know, entertain themselves on the, on the weekend. They did this so that many, many la layers of wisdom would be found in, the, in their holy works. And that way they would sort out, you know, the people from the, 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 the courtyard of the Gentiles right? Gentiles basically meaning people who are not really spiritual, serious, not serious. 
you know, pagans or that's, in fact, that's what they used to call pagans, and that's very derogatory because it, it, it shouldn't mean anything bad. Um, but the Romans used to say all oh, the hillbilly pagans. Pagano meant someone who lived out in, the, out in the sticks, you know, country hick. So that's why it's derogatory, but it isn't. Their worship was based on this. Um, but um, those levels were put in there so that he who has ears and eyes to see would look deeper and dig deeper. That's why it's called esoteric or occult, the Prisca Theologia. Because, you know, you ain't going to just give it to someone who um, abuses that information. It's like you're giving, uh, you know, a $1,000 um, iPhone to your nine-year-old son who's known for breaking everything you've given him, right? Well, you wouldn't do it, would you? You'd probably get a cheap phone and give it to them or something like that. So, um, so wisdom is supposed to be respected. And this is how you respect it. When you hide it and you give it to people who deserve it enough. And they did a wonderful job in doing this. This sine wave represents time. And the seven, the seven fellows that go through there, the seven planets, they, seven represents time and this represents space. You see, this is the space that they're allowed to go in. These are the titans. And, um, and, and as they go, they always make these sine waves, right? Um, and so this represents the flow of time. And that's what sin is. Sin is, these, everything is spirals, okay? So, so this, this, this spiral is not exactly uh, two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional, which makes it a helix, okay? Helical. Um, but as it does that, the spiral, it, it actually manifests physical bodies. And that's the spirit that it's talking about, the spirit behind the spiral. And it always is serpentary or a septenary. Okay, seven is the number of nature. Let me just read some choice information from uh, Who is This King of Glory? This is a beautiful book by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. If you ever want to get into the deep, deep stuff of this and what the Bible was really written for, this guy explains many beautiful things, okay? So we have the four elements. And he talks about these numbers that appear in the Bible, 4, 3, 12, 7, always those numbers, 40. Why? Well, it's because of, because of time units which describe the spiral, the serpent, the sine wave, the sin that we're in. You see, when you get caught in time, um, when, you have, when, you, when you're full of sine waves, you're, you're sinning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we're caught in time. That is sin, in the sine wave. It's all science. Uh, 3, 4, 7, 12 and 40 are indeed among the most sharply revelatory keys to the entire system of scriptural interpretation. It is ridiculous that Christian exegesis of its own book has for 16 centuries laboured at the interpretation with practically no regard for the meaning of these numbers. It will, be later, it will later be seen as a clear evidence of esoteric incompetence. It has remained for students outside the pale of Christian apologetics to interpret the Bible most capably and profoundly. Uh, <clears throat> what were the twelve disciples, if not men? In the esoteric understanding, they were the same in twelve aspects of the, of the three kings of wise men were in the threefold division. Or, uh, they were the same three powers of spirit, further subdivided into twelve aspects. They were just the spiritual power and intelligence uh, which is the Christ itself manifesting its wholeness in a 12-part segmentation in the same way in which the atomic force of the universe manifests in a seven-part differentiation. So the spiritual nucleus of life manifests in a 12-fold unfoldment. Nature sounds a seven-key octave and divine mind sounds a 12-key diapason. 
So divine mind has 12 keys. So mind, spirit, mind over matter. Matter is seven. That's why we have seven luminaries, seven Elohim or cosmocrators. You see, these, these seven, these Elohim, they've been called um, the demiurge, the second creator, because they create physical things. And voila, here we are. Take one of the planets away and we disappear too. So they are the ones that through their, their orbits and their energies and their powers, they are the ones that are giving us shape and form and, and everything. There's not a thing that they don't give us. Okay, Al-Biruni, the, um, the Islamic astrologer of the 10th century. The various organs of a plant are distributed to different planets. Thus, the stem of a tree is appropriated to the sun. The stem of a tree belongs to the sun. The roots to Saturn, the thorns, twigs and bark to Mars, the flowers to Venus, the fruit to Jupiter, the leaves to the moon and the seed to Mercury. They control everything. In fact, Mercury, the right brain, controls all of our senses. That's why Mercury, or Hermes, the Hermetica, uh, in the East they call Hermes uh, Buddha. The Romans called um, him Mercury. Well, he controls the five senses. That's why he's the messenger of the God. You know, when you touch something, you're getting a message, are you not? Well, that's Mercury. That's what the planets are doing. The planets are giving us, are bestowing us these gifts. Uh, <clears throat> even if the fruit of a plant, like a melon, even in the fruit of a plant, like a melon, the constituent parts are divided among several planets. The plant itself and the flesh of the fruit belong to the sun. It's moisture to the moon. It's rind to Saturn. Smell and colour to Venus. Taste to Jupiter. Seed to Mercury. And the skin of the seed and its shape to Mars. It is rare that only one planet furnishes the indicators for one subject or object. Generally, two or more are associated. As for example, when two elementary qualities are present, obviously related to two different planets. Thus, the onion is related by its warmth to Mars and by its moisture to Venus. Uh, and opium by its coldness to Saturn and its dryness to Mercury. So when one, anyone speaks of Saturn as the significator of opium, it is merely its coldness that is referred to. And if Mercury is cited in the same capacity, it is due to its dryness. Right? Because there's cold and hot, dry and wet. They are the, the, uh, the virtues, the active and the passive virtues of astrology. And each planet has two of those virtues. Right? So we can see how the planets, how the planets uh, are creators, how they are cosmocrators. Uh, the Armonian artificers of Egypt that gouge out matter. They're always gouging out matter through space and making things, manifesting things. And uh, of course they are beneficent, but they are also tyrants. You see, Saturn for instance, whatever is born in his kingdom must perish. Whatever is born in time, he's the boss of time. Will always be devoured by time. And in fact, that's, that's what um, the, um, the astrology and astrotheology is teaching us. It's teaching us that journey, how it works, the 12 labours that we are to perform, as Samson performed, and the 12 disciples of Jesus, the 12 uh, sons of Israel, Israel meaning Isis, Ra and El, the ones that go around the wheel, the gospel. Now, I want to get into... Uh, some, some of these beautiful, wonderful writers, okay? They've, they've done some amazing uh, works of art and I want to show you what's in their, these books. Here's a guy called Malik H. Jabbar and he's got uh, five, five or six books, I think. This one might be his sixth book and this one is a series of five and there's a picture of the books there. Um, if you go to uh, his website, this is how he uh, introduces his, his work. 
Welcome. This site provides information on the mythological origins of all universal religions. Religious scriptures are a registry of astronomical phenomena written in a mythological format. The evolution of our modern religious concepts began with astronomy and evolved through mythology and astrology into modern religion. Many of the Hebrew myth concepts are traceable to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Jesus Christ, the Son, God, is a cosmic myth on par with Osiris, Horus, Samson, Adonis, Moses, Abraham, Solomon, Noah, Krishna, Mithra, Quetzalcoatl and many other solar demigods. Evidence clearly shows that the Twelve Apostles are symbols of the zodiac sign and that Jesus Christ symbolised the sun, God, in, the sun, in some aspects a moon god. It is clear that the tales within the Bible are allegorical depictions of the interactions between elements of the cosmos. Religion exists at two levels, the esoteric and the, the exoteric and the esoteric, the inner and the outer. The inner religion is the one where you go within, and the outer one is the one, the book, the book religions, you know. Oh, read the watchtower and awake, then you'll be saved, you'll, you know. Uh, <laughs> they've all got their, their uh, publications and paraphernalia. That's the exoteric. The inner is already, you're already equipped with the inner one. That you've got forever. You're never denied that. Anywhere you go in the universe, you are never denied contact with source. Uh, so, you know, this exposes the foolishness of exoteric religion. Exoteric religion is, is an invention for uh, teaching the mechanics to children. Because that's, that's the way they, uh, they remember models and they remember and imprint images and symbols on their minds. But grown-ups are supposed to wake up. Yeah. The exoteric level, literal level of religious philosophy is pure idiocy. To think that the fantastic tales of demons and multi-headed monsters and miraculous events of every stripe, such as making the sun stand still, dividing the Red Sea, destroying the world by flood and all the other related nonsense, is accepted without hesitation on the basis of faith, is astonishing. Nevertheless, it is so. The esoteric level of religion is a science that is mathematical, coherent, logical and provable. Well, I've done it, beyond a doubt. <clears throat> but the science of truth is veiled by the mask of mythology. The science of truth is veiled by the mask of mythology. Some are repulsed by this mask and unfortunately turn away and denounce all concepts that support the possible existence of a creator God force. The great majority accepts the myth at face value, believe it or not. But fortunately, there are some that choose the path of investigation of which you and I are a part. The purpose of these books is to explain the seminal relationship between astronomy, myth and modern religion. The books prove that ancient myth slash religion was in fact a written pictorial symbolic record of the celestial movements within the cosmos under the type of myth mythical deities. The history of the biblical Jesus Christ is drawn from the symbolical history of prior sun deities. His birth through to his death, as represented in the Bible, is a symbolical representation of the annual si sun cycle and other cycles at different levels of interpretation. Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, and I read that just so that you can get a taste of, of what this guy's thinking and how, how his, his books are just exquisite. I've learnt a lot from him actually. I've learnt a lot about these cycles from reading his books. Uh, Malik H. Jabbar. And you can get, on, get them on Amazon, they're only about eight, eight bucks a piece. Uh, but some of the juicy things that he talks about, it's just amazing. Um, he understands that uh, Jacob, for instance, was the name uh, of the sun below the equator and Israel when he gets a name changed and he, and he um, wrestles with the angel and finally he conquers, he gets his name changed to Israel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Abraham used to be Abram. Abram is the sun below the equator. At 90 years of age, 
90 degrees, he gets a name change to Abraham. You see, so uh, he's got all that stuff in there. It's just incredible. Um, I'd just like to read a little bit, really, some choice stuff from here. The gateways be, um, between the lower world and the upper world are the equinoxes. These are gateways. The vernal equinox is the gateway to the high hemisphere, equated with redemption. And the autumnal equinox is the gateway to the lower hemisphere, equated with suffering and death, according to the ancient symbolism. So when the sun falls below the equinox in the last part of the year and the earth approaches winter, the ancients saw that event as the imprisonment of the sun or the wounding of the sun, whereas its light was impeded and made ineffective. The imprisonment of Christ and the eventual crucifixion of him is symbolic of the span from the autumnal equinox to the sun's death at the winter solstice in the annual phase of the solar symbolism. Of course, biblically, the resurrection of Christ takes place proximate to the vernal equinox. This is because of the cultural input from the Hebrew Christians who wrote the biblical, biblical Christ myth. They fashioned the Christ after the sacrificial lamb of the post Passover festival. See, when the sun finally passes over, they sacrifice the lamb, Ares, the lamb of God. Uh, <clears throat> they also linked, oh sorry, they, the custom of the Jews to sacrifice uh, lambs or goats proximate to the equinoxes, both vernal and autumnal. You see, the, gr the goat is... Um, here's the, uh, the sheep and here's the goats in Capricorn. Cap. The sheep. See, Capricorn rules the, uh, the solstice and uh, Aries rules the equator. So this is in the book of Daniel where the, the he-goat and the ram are at loggerheads and they're always chasing each other, right? That's talking about this. That's the goat and that's the sheep. It's the solstices and the equinoxes. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I'll, I'll read that from another one of his books in a minute. Um, but I'll just finish here. The animal was the scape... Um, <clears throat> They also link this, this sacrifice, killing of the animal, to the expiation of their sins. The animal was termed a scapegoat, a scapegoat that carried the load of punishment for the accumulated sins of the Jewish population. This is where the myth comes from that Jesus died for our sins, for the sins of the world. It is simply a copy of the old pagan superstitious customs of the Nord nomadic Hebrews. The Bible clearly calls Jesus the Passover, that he was a substitute for the lamb of the Jews brought forth to human form under the Christian doctrine, which doctrine was composed of the early Christians who were actually Jews, members of a Jewish sect that later, over time, became distinct as Christians. The uh, Islamic religion, uh, early in its history, acknowledged astrology as, as a science, officially. So uh, they had the, um, the courage to do that because Rome, on the other hand, was, was killing Hermetists, Huguenots and Waldenses and Sicinians, etc. And in the Renaissance, you see, the Renaissance was founded on Hermes, the Prisca Theologia. Giordano Bruno was killed for saying, unless we go back to Hermes, that's why I'm devoting this to Giordano Bruno, because I, uh, like all these other guys, are continuing to further his work. Uh, and most of his work was de dealing with this and, and the fictional aspects of the Bible and teaching that the, there's only one religion slash science in the universe and that's this science. Yeah. This is it. This explains us, this describes us, this, this is what we do, this is it. And there it is. Jesus is there. Peter is there. Jupiter. Paul is there. Apollo. Yeah. The sun. Yeah. Mercury is there. Hermes. That's John. They're all there. Satan, Saturn. The characters are all there. This is what 
Everywhere you go in the universe where physical matter appears, there will be seven shining luminaries or orbs that will produce that. Will produce that. Yes. 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 It's mind over matter. This nature sounds that that sound, according to, um, as he says, uh, nature sounds a seven key octave. Octave means eight, right? But, you know, you always round these, these uh, like, you know, in music, you've, you've got your seven diatonic notes, but it's an octave, right? So you round off, we are an octave, or we are a septenary. Everything in our bodies is septenary. The seven chambers of the brain, seven chambers of the heart, the seven orifices in the body, the seven vital organs, etc., etc. Everything about our nature is septenary. Mm. It's a serpent. That's the serpent. And uh, the serpent is sitting, sitting here. Um, a fucus is in the sign of Scorpio. <coughs> Let's have a look at Scorpio. Scorpio with the red, red star in it. Okay. Um, there is a fucus, the serpent bearer. So a fucus... What he does, he's carrying the serpent, and the serpent's head is right next to the scales of Libra. You see, we, we saw that before, right? And the serpent is, is saying to the, the woman, and Booty's her husband, is, is Adam, this is Eve, Virgo, it's saying to her, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the good, this is the evil, and the scales, <coughs> are denoting that because once the sun goes through these signs it comes to a point where it has to flip over its polarity it's given an electric summer but now it has to change its nature and it must flip that polarity and give produce a winter so it tastes from the tree of good and evil having tasted good now it must have evil and that's the serpent that is at the tree deceiving the woman because she eats from it first Booties follows. So let's have a look at uh, the four horsemen, shall we, of the apocalypse. Uh, the white horse symbolises the vernal equinox. The red horse symbolises the autumnal equinox. The black horse, the winter solstice. That's where black satin is. And the pale horse, or green, symbolises the summer solstice. You see, green and lush is that horseman of the apocalypse, that cardinal point. And as those, you see, the sun is always depicted, the sun is always depicted being transported around with four horses. Okay, four seasons, four horses, four uh, cardinal points. And, um, and as they go around, they have different natures and different qualities. Of course, the, uh, this, these are very similar, the equinoxes, right? Spring and autumn are very similar, but summer and winter, big difference, okay? White is the colour of the good spirit and in its mythical aspects correlates astronomically to the vernal equinox. Red, the opposite or opponent counterpart of white, in much of the symbolism and represents the autumnal equinox. Matter is counterbalanced by spirit, just as the autumnal equinox is counterbalanced by the vernal equinox. So the red horse is the autumnal equinox, the controller of the entrance into the infernal regions of the lower hemisphere. Black signifies the darkness of the pit of the lower world where the sun is shrouded by dark blackness. Green represents the verdant quality of the summer season brought in by the summer solstice. The Bible uses the term pale horse, but all of the biblical dictionaries define the term pale as synonymous to the colour green. Now, the riders and the horses, they are different. The riders and the horses, one has a scale, that's Libra. And these are the riders of the horses, okay? Uh, the riders of the horses are distinct and separate from the horses in terms of their identity. One reason that other scholars over the years and centuries have failed to interpret this symbolism correctly is that they have blended the individual riders and their assigned horses into single entities, which is an error. The riders of the four horses are the zodiacal signs that pass over the stations of the horses. 
cardinal points. During the day, year or astrological era that may be targeted by the symbolism, the descriptions of the riders give us sufficient information for their identities. He that sat on the white horse had a bow and a crown, which indicates the sector of Sagittarius. Bow and a crown. Um, <clears throat> with the, the bow. Uh, the bow is um, Chaos Australis. That's the bow in the sector of Sagittarius. Um, and the crown is Corona Australis. Remember we spoke about Corona Borealis in uh, Libra, the crown of thorns. Well, this is Corona Australis of that sector. He that sat on the red horse is described as a killer and a disruptor of peace, which indicates the killer scorpion that carries the sting of death, whose venom ushers in the sorrow and misery of the winter season as the sun dips below the equinoxes into the sector of Scorpio. He that sat on the black horse carried balances in his hand, which of course is the scales of Libra. He that sat on the pale green horse was called Death and the governor of Hell, which is of course Saturn in Capricorn the well-known goat devil of the zodiac. And, of course, this corresponds with the dragon that drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Have you ever heard, heard of that in Revelation? And I saw the dragon and he hurled a third of God's stars from heaven. Right? Well, the constellation of Dra Draco uh, is in uh, Sagittarius, but it goes from goes from Virgo all the way down to Scorpio. That's exactly a third, 120 degrees of arc is occupied by Draco on the northern throne. It's a big constellation in the north. We can't see it, but it's up, up there where the, the Big Dipper is and all that. And Draco controls the North Pole. He gets about three stars to sit on the North Pole during the 24,000 year processional cycle. So he's basically the boss, right? And when Draco goes down, when Draco goes down, in other words, from Virgo downwards, this is the sign of betrayal, Virgo, the dragon hurls a third of God's angels down to the earth. We are told by these verses of the Bible that the dragon's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven this symbolism points directly to the zodiacal signs Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius and Capricorn, which are situated right in the fold of the dragon's tail. I have explained conclusively in book four, he's got his five books here, that the dragon of the apocalyptic heavens of the Bible symbolises the constellation Draconis uh, with the stellar symbolism. The tail of the biblical dragon of the heavens in the Bible is synonymous to the tail of the cosmic dragon, which is in fact the constellation Draconis. The constellation of Draconis stretches over nearly half of the sky's celestial longitude. And at the time of the uh, biblical editing, the tail of Draconis traversed the span of the zodiac stretching from the autumnal equinox through the winter solstice, a span of four zodiacal constellations, thus denoting the fall of the sun into the lower regions of the cosmos as demarcated by the celestial equator.